about membrane transport, how substances get in and out of cells. So far, we've focused on the anatomy of the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, that phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins. But today we're going to study, uh, focus on the physiology, uh, in other words, the function, and in this case, how substances get across the cell membrane in and out of the cell. Now, cells are bathed in a nutrient-rich fluid. This extracellular fluid, called interstitial fluid, has thousands of ingredients. It's like a nutritious soup, like a pho or a bone broth. And to remain healthy, each cell has to be able to extract from this mix the exact amount of substances it needs at specific times getting the right substances in and out of the cell at just the right times, just the right quantity. Substances like amino acids, sugars, fatty acids, vitamins and minerals, and regulatory substances like hormones and neurotransmitters. Even the balance of water how much water is getting in and out of the cell is crucial for the cells to remain healthy and function properly. Speaking about water, think about what percentage of our body is water, about how much of our cells and body are made up of water. Well, approximately 70%. Think about what that water is like. Well, that water, that base, is a salt water, just like the ocean or the sound. So take a minute, close your eyes, and imagine the ocean or the sound. Take a deep breath and smell the salt water and the seaweed. Hmm, salt water, ocean spray. Take another deep breath. That salt water is a beautiful start. Now let's make a nutritious broth. We're going to get our vitamins and our minerals from a nice uh, bone base. We can put in some oxtails so the bone marrow seeps out, get some good minerals, get some carrots, leeks, garlic, celery, balance our pH with some vinegar, get some more amino acids with some fish sauce, spice it up, herbs and spices like cinnamon, cloves, coriander, star anise, and cardamom. Excellent. And in our interstitial fluid, we have amino acids, sugars, fatty acids, vitamins and minerals, and regulatory substances like hormones and neurotransmitters, all in salt water. If you've ever had homemade pho or a homemade bone broth, it's incredible, or an authentic one. It's nutrition you can feel right down into your core, right down into your cells. All right. So we're going to look at specific, tran uh, specific transport mechanisms, but when it comes right down to it, there's only two basic types of how, or two basic ways that substances get across the cell membrane: passive transport and active transport. And the basic difference between the two all comes down to energy. In passive transport, the cell does not have to use its own energy because the substances move by kinetic forces uh, with concentration gradients or pressure forces. Whereas in active transport, the cell has to use a lot of its own energy to make substances move across concentration gradients or to get uh, export substances it makes out of the cell or 
take substances like bacteria into the cell and break them down. But the big difference here is all about energy. And here on the picture on the right, we've got the little uh, starburst picture with ATP. That stands for adenosine triphosphate, and that's the body's favorite form of energy. It's like cash. Now, so it all comes down to two basic ways, passive and active. But there are specific types of passive and active transport. In passive transport, we have diffusion, and there are different types of diffusion, such as simple, facilitated, and osmosis, which has to do with the movement of water. And then we have filtration. And a lot of textbooks uh, focus on the diffusion because once you start looking at filtration, it actually looks at a combination of forces uh, at play at the same time. And uh, so we are going to take a look at that, um, but we're going to start off keeping it simple with simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. And then we have to look at a combination of forces to understand filtration. And then in active transport, there's different uh, types, such as protein pumps, endocytosis, and exocytosis. Excuse me, the computer's in a little loop here. I put my recorder on pause, but then it gets the uh, annotations and the voice off sync. So just bear with me whenever we're caught in a little loop here. There we go. All right, so passive versus active transport, what's the difference? The basic difference has to do with whether the cell needs to use energy or not. Let's take a look at an analogy. Passive transport is like tubing down a river going with the current. You can kick back, feet and hands splashing in the water, even bring along a cooler, even bring along your dog. You're going with the water current, so you don't need to use your energy. You can just kick back and get a suntan all day. Active transport is like fish, like salmon, swimming upstream. If you've ever seen salmon swim upstream, they have to twist about in the water and use tremendous strength and muscles to jump up little waterfalls. It's pretty cool and amazing. And if you eat salmon, I mean, they're, you know, there's a little bit of fat there, but they're incredibly muscle. I mean, they're like pure muscle because they're using a ton of energy to swim upstream. So our main difference here is all about energy. And the body's fam favorite form of energy is ATP, which stands for, it's an abbreviation for adenosine triphosphate. It's very important that you understand and memorize that the body uses ATP for energy. Now, here's a handy little mnemonic little way to help you memorize uh, the, this um, active transport uses cells energy in the form of ATP. Now the ATP in a, uh, actually is an abbreviation for adenosine triphosphate, the A to the T to the P. The A for adenosine, the T for tri, and the P for phosphate. But handily enough, Conveniently, our active transport has ATP in it. So we have an A for active, a T for trans, and a P for port. And our active transport uses ATP as its favorite form of energy. The other main difference are uh, the forces at play. Now, we're going to first look at the concentration gradient. And in passive transport, things go from high to low. 
and they go with the concentration gradient, like floating downstream. And in active transport, they go against the concentration gradient, like salmon swimming upstream. We're also going to look at other forces like pressure. And again, the passive transport is just going to go with the natural flow of pressure, so there's no extra energy required by the cell. All right, let's take a look at a quick little video here. Now, it might seem logical to first uh, watch a video that compares active and passive transport, but I've got a little video here that I think gets you started understanding uh, diffusion and osmosis uh, pretty easily. So we're going to start there before we uh, start really comparing active and passive transports more. All Animals and plants are made of cells, and cells need to give out and take in certain chemicals in order to function. Let's see how this happens. First, diffusion. Diffusion occurs when gas particles spread out. Diffusion also happens when particles dissolved in solution spread out. Here is a drop of ink. It has a high concentration of inkiness. When we drop ink into water, the inky particles spread out. They move from where there's a lot of ink a high concentration to where there is less, a low concentration. They move from a high to low concentration, so we say they diffuse down a concentration gradient. The greater the difference between the high and low levels, the faster the spread. When you burn toast, the smell gets round the house because of diffusion. Smoke particles move from the toaster, a high concentration of smoke, to the rest of the house, which generally you'd hope have a low concentration of smokiness. Well, I scrape most of the burnt bits off, and here's the toast going round my gut. Food gets turned into the chemical products of digestion, amino acids, sugars, etc. The concentration of these chemicals in the gut is high, but in the nearby blood capillaries, it is low. The desperate for digested toast. Result, the particles move from the gut to the blood by diffusion. Diffusion or wily cunning? No, right, diffusion. Take a deep breath in. Where does the oxygen in the air go? Well, firstly, into the alveolar airspace in the lungs. But where we need it is in the blood. You can breathe out now. How does the oxygen reach the blood circulating through the lungs? It diffuses from a high concentration of oxygen in the airspace, across a thin membrane and into the blood, where there is a low concentration of oxygen. Without this mechanism, you wouldn't last the time it takes for me to explain all this. The thing to remember is that diffusion... ...is movement from high to low concentration. And the greater the concentration gradient, the faster this takes place. Okay, I think you've sussed that. Let's look at the other mechanism for moving stuff around. That's called osmosis. For this, we're going to need a partially permeable membrane and two solutions with different concentrations. Before you dash off to get them, you've got loads already in every cell in your body. Each cell wall is a partially permeable membrane. Mmm, sounds attractive. But what is it? It's a barrier that lets some substances through, but not others. In osmosis, the chemical they let through is water. If we put pure water on one side of the membrane, and a chemical solution on the other, then you know what's going to happen. The water will diffuse from high to low concentration of water. It goes from the pure water side, which is a high concentration of water, to the other side, where there is a lower concentration of water. This puts water into the chemical solution side, making it more dilute. Works every time. All the while, a small amount of water is flowing back the other way due to random movement of molecules. But most movement is from pure water in the solution, making it weaker. Eventually, the concentrations on both sides of the membrane are the same. Then, there is an equal flow of water in both directions. We have reached equilibrium. Oh, that's better. Now, take a look at my sister's spider plant. Not looking too good, is it? If she'd remembered to water it, then it'd look... 
like this. Water gets into plant root cells by osmosis and then up into the rest of the plant by more osmosis. This makes the plant's tissues stiff so they can hold up the leaves. So that's about it. Remember, diffusion takes particles from an area of high concentration to one of low concentration, as in the burnt toast incident. And osmosis takes water through a partially permeable membrane from a weak solution of dissolved solute to a more concentrated solution, as in plant roots, so long as someone waters them in the first place, obviously. All right, I think that's a good start, but let's clarify a few things. All right, so in diffusion, molecules or ions move from an area of high concentration to low concentration, but how does this happen? and why, and a few other things to clarify. So the molecules are, um, you'll often see a diagram like this, by the way. You'll often see like a uh, cartoon sort of like diagram like this um, with little dots representing molecules. Let's say these little pink dots here in the bottom diagram, let's say they're oxygen um, because diffusion of oxygen is uh, critical to get oxygen to all the cells in our body. So let's say we've got little oxygen particles here. Now, when you see a little diagram like this, and whether it's a com uh, com uh, uh, animation or a static drawing, you'll, you'll often see represented that there are a lot of particles on one side and fewer particles on the other side and that the particles are going to diffuse across the membrane from where there are a lot of them to where there are a few of them. Let's say, let's pretend we had a thousand pink dots on the left and only ten pink dots on the right and so of course we're going to have uh, a lot of movement of the particles from the left to the right until it's balanced out. Um, but some important things to uh, understand here is that we don't just have movement from left to right and once they balance out, let's say we get to where there's 500 on the left and 500 on the right, it doesn't all just stop. These things never stop moving. So the molecules and the ions, they are constantly in motion and they are constantly in random motion. So we don't just have traffic from where we have lots of them, and then the traffic is headed over here to where there are few of them. What we actually have is the little molecules moving around in every single direction randomly. And it just so happens, looks like these are little boy molecules. No, that's just because of the symbol. All right, so what happens is where you have more of them, and they move around randomly, just by odds, just by random chance, because there are so many more of them, they're going to end up bouncing into each other, hitting each other, and then ricocheting off of each other. They have a bigger chance of doing that. And they also have a bigger chance of going over into the direction of the plasma membrane, and depending on the substance, whether it goes straight on through the phospholipid part or whether it's got to hit right into a protein channel, an integral protein to make its way through. Either way, if there's a thousand particles on the left and only ten particles on the right, we have a much greater chance with the particles moving around randomly that the ones on the left are going to find their way to the right. However, and this is an important however, the molecules on both sides are moving around randomly and some of the ones from the right can go to the left and some of the left can go to the right and so this movement never stops and so when they say they get balanced out um, what it actually is is net equilibrium and so they're basically you know roughly balanced out but there's always going to be some still going from left to right and right to left and they're always bouncing around it's kind of like one of those air lotto machines um, with the balls uh, moving around and if you had uh, let's say we built a little contraption with an air lotto machine on um, two air lotto machines um, next to each other 
and a kind of a membrane or holes between the two of them. Let's see, we're stuck in a little loop here. All right, there we go. Um, let's take a look at a layer an air lotto machine. Now this isn't exactly like the movement of mo molecules because the movement of molecules is uh, they are self-propelling and with this air lotto machine there's actually you know air blowing it but it's kinda like this and if the little molecules are bouncing around and let's say we had a thousand of them in this machine they would just by odds you know find their way to the little hole to find their way out faster than if we had a machine with let's say only twenty balls in it and so they're not going to find their way out as often all right now if you think about um, that uh, phospholipid bilayer. In the one uh, video we saw, she talked about it like uh, Oreo cookies with the creamy center. Or you could think about it like little balls with little tails. And of course, we have a fluid mosaic model where, because of the chemical structure here and the polar and nonpolar sides, these little phospholipids are going to self-arrange themselves and when they get jostled about they're going to go back into place so in our little phospholipid balls with feet the little balls are the charged or polar side and because they're charged they are hydrophilic water loving and the little tails the lipid sides are hydrophobic or water hating because they are not charged. So in that, uh, the little lipid tails are our Oreo uh, creamy center of the Oreo cookies. This center core, being non-charged, is hydrophobic. So it's going to kind of have a tendency to push polar molecules away and keep them from crossing over. Now, this is handy um, as part of a selectively permeable membrane, but it also poses a sort of a problem or a, a, a mystery of how do molecules then cross over this hydrophobic core? Well, think about what kind of molecules could maybe cross over and what other structure we have here in this phospholipid bilayer in addition to these phospholipids. Well, think back to the lab, the video with the bubbles. What let the pencil go through the bubbles uh, without breaking or popping the bubble? Well, one of the methods is uh, for substances that were lipid soluble. So if you take the pencil and you roll it around in the soap solution, or remember she talked about the kids putting their hands in the bubbles, and then once they're covered, they can actually get their whole hand through the bubbles. Whee! So if it's covered in lipids, it's lipid soluble, then those substances can go right through. They can become basically like contiguous uh, or become one with the bubble solution and make their way through. Little particles, little molecules, little ions, uh, some of them are small enough to pass right through the um, phospholipid uh, uh, area or through the membrane channels. Um, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide and sometimes they are assisted by carrier molecules um, that specifically uh, link uh, like a lock and key to specific molecules and we'll take a closer look at how that works specifically but think about some of the processes that you know about maybe in the video a uh, critical process that we have to do all day long that requires diffusion happening, happening at a rather rapid uh, rate. 
Well, let's think about breathing. So we have to get oxygen into every cell of our bodies. How does this happen so quickly? Well, because, you know, these are just molecules bouncing around. And every cell in your body needs to get oxygen. Well, fortunately, the plasma membrane is very, very thin. In fact, it's only about as um, one one thousandth the thickness of a piece of paper. So the distance that they uh, have to travel is very short. And this is this is critical for getting oxygen into the cells. And uh, one of my favorite uh, anatomy podcast lecturers, um, I learned something really fascinating from him. His name is Dr. Gerald Cisadlo. And uh, he's kind of got like this Garrison Keillor kind of voice and um, just brilliant at explaining the physiology. Um, you can look him up and uh, listen to his uh, Anatomy and Physiology podcast. But um, anyway, one thing fascinating I learned from him is how close every cell in the body has to be to the capillaries to get oxygen or they'll die. How close do you think cells have to be to capillaries? Think about the blood vessels bringing blood from your heart out to the cells, and those little blood vessels get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they're these rich capillary beds. Well, those capillaries have to be within two cells distance of each and every cell to keep it alive. So if you picture that with how many uh, cells we have in the body, I mean, that is a very, very, very vast network of capillaries. Pretty incredible. So let's take a look at uh, how this diffusion happens specifically. Now, each of those mechanisms we just mentioned basically has, you know, a specific name. So when the substances are small enough to just travel right on through the, um, without any help whatsoever. They can basically do that through the phospholipid portion of the membrane. This picture on the far left, the little teeny tiny molecules like oxygen can go straight on through the phospholipids and that is called simple diffusion. So when the little teeny uh, uh, ions and molecules can go straight on through the phospholipid bilayer, that's called simple diffusion. Now, uh, bigger molecules, for example, they're um, going to go through protein channels. There's actually different kinds of integral proteins, but if it's a kind of a protein channel where different substances can go through, and it's a non-specific transporter. It's basically like a water slide. In fact, it, they call it an aqueous channel. So um, these can be called uh, non-specific transporters. But the the common term that um, rather than talking about non-specific transporter versus specific transporter, what uh, the most common thing to look at or to call this here is facilitated diffusion. And that would be our second picture here. So if a substance can go through an integral protein, go through the little water slide, then um, that is using basically a nonspecific uh, protein channel. And these diagrams, and this is a very typical way to show this kind of a cartoon-like drawing of these uh, uh, integral proteins. But one thing I think is really cool about proteins, and is actually going to be important to understand a lot of physiological processes is that proteins are really, really huge molecules. They have lots and lots of amino acids strung together. It's, it's not uncommon to have hundreds of amino acids strung together in one protein. And so what happens with a super long uh, string of amino acids is you're going to have parts of this really long chain that have uh, slightly positive, slightly negative charge, they're going to basically then attract 
other parts of the chain. And so what ends up happening is it gets all folded in on itself and it becomes like this very intricate, complicated origami structure. And so rather than this kind of simple, straight tube, uh, if we looked at an aqueous channel or a water slide, it would be much more like one of those really fun uh, twisting tube kind of water slides. And that may seem like, uh, you know, kind of a detail that doesn't matter at this point. Uh, it's certainly not something I would test you on, but these kind of concepts become important to form pictures in your head and to understand physiology as we go along and understand different processes. Because trust me, if you don't understand that proteins are really giant molecules and that water gets attracted to it, um, these different things I'm going to explain along the way, I mean, we're really laying some critical groundwork concepts here, then as you study each system of the body, there's just going to be a lot of memorization. And anatomy can seem really boring and just like a lot of a lot of Latin and Greek terminology if you're just memorizing stuff. But once you can start to understand the concepts and form a picture in your head, it becomes completely fascinating. And then when you start to think about processes like this going on in every cell of the body and that all these cells are interacting in tissues and all these tissues are interacting in systems and all the systems are interacting, it's, it's pretty incredible. Now, there's other integral proteins where the substances that go through basically have to uh, fit like a, a specific key that fits a specific lock. Uh, kind of try to draw an old school kind of a key here. My grandma actually had like these kind of cool, actually have one of them, one of these cool old kind of keys. And now the actual shape here actually again comes to that complicated, twisted origami of the really, 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 really long protein molecule. So what we have here is a lock and key kind of a mechanism where this twisted little fold of the protein that's going to have uh, amino acid has to fit chemically perfectly with this little slot or it's not going to open up the channel. So just the right, let's say it could be a protein, it could even be a here in this example, they're using a glucose, in other words, a sugar, and let's say it fits just right, then it can go through the, um, the carrier molecule. But facilitated diffusion, whether it involves uh, specific uh, channels or non-specific channels, works with integral proteins embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. And it's basically like, you know, substances that are too big or they're charged wrong to go through without some assistance or a special, you know, bigger um, way to get through. And it's like, um, it's like taking a shawl and wrapping the molecule to carry it across. Or if you're taking a walk with your kids or your dog and you come across some shattered glass on the sidewalk and you want to safely get them across that glass, you could pick them up and take them across. Now our last example of diffusion is osmosis. And osmosis involves the movement of water across the barrier. And water is pretty uh, tricky here. Um, that it can actually move through the phospholipid part or special embedded proteins called aquaporins. Stuck in a little loop here again, excuse me. press pause here, but if I do, it's going to throw off the timing of the voice and all of our um, annotations. So pardon me when uh, we get stuck here.
There we go. Sorry about that. All right, so how quickly uh, substances diffuse across, subs uh, across the membrane actually ver uh, has different variables. And um, the speed of diffusion is very important. So it's uh, important to get substances like oxygen to the cells quickly and constantly. And we have a lot of substances that we have to get in and out of the cells. So the body has to actually basically strategize or maximize its ability to um, get diffusion to happen quickly. In the little uh, video, that we just watched, they talked about the higher the concentration gradient, the quicker the rate of diffusion. And that is true. So if there is a bigger difference of the number of molecules or the percent percentage of molecules, a bigger concentration gradient, then the diffusion is going to happen faster. There are other uh, variables as well. Um, if it is a higher temperature or warmer, the diffusion is going to happen faster. And that's actually why I have the pictures of the bee boxes here, other than the fact that I just completely love bees. A uh, video or two ago, um, I gave the analogy and talked about how if you have some bee boxes um, in the sunshine and some bee boxes in the shade, when the sun warms up the bee boxes, um, you'll see a flurry of activity where the worker bees come out of the little slits here at the bottom. If these uh, boxes on the right are in the sunshine, there's going to be a lot of bees, just constant traffic in and out of these little slits when they're warmed up. The little worker bees are going to come in and out, do their little waggle dance, show their friends where to find flowers, how far away it is, where the good stuff is. But over here, these boxes on the left, if they're in the shade, you're not going to see much activity. It's going to be pretty sleepy hives there. Um, this is a good analogy for uh, diffusion, how it happens uh, faster with uh, higher temperatures. But there's other really important ways uh, to change the uh, rate of diffusion. And one of my favorite things to look at is how surface area influences this. Because the body has to maximize uh, increased surface area for all kinds of different uh, physiological mechanisms to happen effectively in a timely manner in every system of the body. And not just diffusion, but all kinds of examples. So, uh, so far we've looked at the diffusion of oxygen to take oxygen in into little alveoli in our lungs when we take a breath in, and then when we actually get that oxygen delivered out to the cells in the body, um, we need to increase the surface area. The body increases surface area for other things as well, um, not even just diffusion, but like the brain. Um, how the brain is structured. So let's let's draw a little diagram. And uh, in case you can't just quite already picture this, um, let's take like a straight line. Let's pretend this line was straight, first of all. Let's pretend this line was straight. Let's pretend this line was 10 centimeters. It's kind of hard to draw with these computer pencils. Let's pretend this line is 10 centimeters. and. Let's pretend it's a semi-permeable membrane and that we have lots of molecules bouncing around here on the left. And of course, they're bouncing around, moving about randomly in every which way, every direction. Now, in our little 10 centimeter line, this is basically how much room we have or opportunity for these molecules to randomly bounce into this membrane and cross over. Well, think about it. If you wanted to increase the speed of diffusion by increasing the surface area, and we basically had a limited space in this regard, we basically had from point A to point B to work with, 
what could you do to increase this surface area? I'm going to use a different color here for my surface area increase solution. You could basically make little valleys and mountain tops, little innies and outies. Take the same distance between A and B. Take a little roller coaster ride up and down, in and out. And the cell membrane does this all of the time. It's a brilliant strategy with cilia and microvilli and villi to make little ups and downs, hills and valleys. And now we've taken this 10 centimeters, and obviously I can't really measure what I just did, but I'm just going to guess here. Um, if we actually took that same distance and measured it, I'm going to say maybe we made it about 10 times or more of what it what it used to be, of all these little spots where the little molecules could have an opportunity, have a chance to bump in and then cross over. So now there's all these little different spots, every, every single one of these little tiny spots where things might bump in and cross over. And the body takes advantage of this to fit stuff into small spaces, too. So not just for diffusion, like we want to get particles, molecules, and ions across, like, you know. Uh, but we could do it for, um, you know, just to increase how much space we could fit in, too. Like the brain. Uh, the brain doesn't look uh, like a basketball. It looks more like a cauliflower, so that we have these little ins and outs to increase the surface area. All right, so that's pretty cool, and the body uses that strategy a lot. Um, even this concentration gradient. See, uh, and there's so many cool concepts in physiology once you start to study them, once you start to understand them, but even this concentration gradient is brilliant. So if you think about it, I mean, the body, if it was just all passive, like a jellyfish floating around, let's say a jellyfish is floating around in the sea, floating around in the current, that jellyfish is going to get exposed to whatever it happens to float around. Let's say that jellyfish ends up in some currents where it's near ferry boats coming in and out all the time. It's, it happens to be in a ferry boat dock. I'm going to guess there's going to be a lot of, you know, oil and other waste products, um, you know, in that high boat traffic area. So that, you know, that jellyfish is going to be exposed to, to those kind of things. But the concentration gradient, your body, let's say we want to massively, um, what the body can do here is a really cool strategy is to purposely create a really high concentration gradient so that when the body needs something to happen quickly, the diffusion can happen quickly. So if you're going to stack the deck in your favor, you're going to have to use energy to basically create a false high concentration gradient. Because, you know, if you think about it, uh, left to their own devices, you know, let's kind of draw our simple example of molecules and let's say you know I mean these are really giant molecules but let's say they were you know a thousand on the left and ten on the right left to their own devices there's going to be a natural diffusion flow of traffic to the right but if you want to stack things in your favor so that over time we don't just have this balance out to roughly 500 and 500, the body can use energy in the form of ATP to basically purposely create a high concentration gradient when you want to get stuff done faster. So think about the mechanisms in the body that you need to get done the fastest.
Now, I know for some of you this is the first time you're taking a formal anatomy class, so you may wonder why I keep introducing different parts of the body. Well, everything integrates like this beautiful orchestra. And so the first time you take anatomy and physiology, especially these intro units, there's a lot of concepts and a lot of systems in the body introduced. Well, first of all, never fear. If we introduce something like you know, how oxygen gets into the body, we'll be coming back to that when we look at the respiratory system with the lungs. We'll be coming back to it when we come back to the cardiovascular system with the heart. Um, but also, anatomy and physiology is one of those things that if you really think about it and you study it, you can really absorb it in layers. And so I always think that the first time you take an anatomy and physiology is just like the tip of the iceberg. You know, I mean, if you really wanted to learn how to do a sport well or any activity well, you wouldn't just take one lesson, you know, and go out into the court and play it and go, oh, no, whatever, I'm not very good. I don't understand this. You know, the coach isn't very good. This doesn't make any sense. I don't understand this sport. I mean, my brother and sister played rugby in college, and, you know, I saw some of their games. They both explained it some. I mean, the first couple times I watched rugby, it's a sport that makes no sense. It takes a while to understand it, and I'm sure it takes even longer to actually be able to play it. That is, if you can survive that long. But so uh, I highly encourage you, um, even if you get confused or frustrated, some of these concepts may seem abstract, or you know, I'm explaining something for another system already. I highly recommend you keep studying anatomy and physiology over and over and over again. I mean, I study it every year. I've been studying anatomy and physiology, oh gosh, like 20 years now. So, and for me, it's really exciting because the more I study it, these different concepts, these different layers will kind of open up and they'd be these beautiful aha moments where it's like, oh, wow, I totally see how that connects to this system. And it becomes really cool and amazing. So I encourage you to spend that kind of time with it. So anyway, the body does this on purpose to do stuff faster. And what kind of stuff needs to happen super quickly in the body? Well, a couple things come to mind for me is the transmission of nerve signals. Like let's say you accidentally touch a uh, tray in the oven when you're trying to take your kale chips out of the oven and the oven's set at 400 degrees and instead of you know having your hand on the um, you know you accidentally touch the tray itself well your body has to make yourself pull away from that burning hot tray really fast or you know you're gonna get a burn and so these nerve signals have to happen really quickly. Muscle contractions have to happen really quickly. So you can pull away the tray. And so your body very cleverly takes advantage of creating a you know, high concentration gradient, a really big difference in the number and percentage of particles across the membrane. So it can basically stack the odds to the order of 10 to 100 to 1,000 times difference across the membrane so that once it opens up the floodgates and lets everything come whooshing in, it comes whooshing in really, really fast. A couple other variables here. The size of the particles. Little teeny particles whiz around faster. You could use an analogy if you look at uh, players on a team, especially like, I mean, you could look at, uh, you know, track events or you could look at football, let's say American football, um, where the players that have to, uh, you know, run um, really quickly are going to be the smaller players and um, the players that are not going to be able to run as fast, um, but they're going to be, you know, needing to be on the front line, those are going to be your bigger players, you know, like three, four hundred. 350, what are they, about 350 pounds? All right, last but not least, the diffusion medium, and this, this has very enjoyable applications. Um, uh, molecules and ions diffuse fastest in, uh, in the air in a gas form, um, which is really nice for, um, we can actually look at the, all of these forms with aromatherapy. 
um, take some essential oils, so the pure extracts from plants. Um, and if we take those pure extracts, like I'm, I'm not sure what kind of trees, what kind of flowers we're looking up up here. I can't tell if they're, would those be apples? But let's pretend, um, I don't think they are, but let's pretend they're orange blossoms because orange essential oil is really amazing. You would take like a whole basket of orange blossoms and distill it out to get just, you know, just a, like a few drops, let's say like 10 drops of the pure plant essence. Well, when that pure essence of the plant is in its leaves or in its roots, in its bark, in its solid form, you're not going to smell the plant as much. You're not going to smell those essential oils as much. But once you extract it out into its liquid form, and let's say you take some of those drops, let's say you take some nice orange essential oil, and you drop some into your bath, you're going to have that diffuse throughout the room pretty quickly. We'll take those same drops and diffuse it in a nice nebulizer or ionizer that um, makes a nice stream of the essential oils, and you can quickly fill up a whole room with that smell, like a you know beautiful walk in the springtime after a rain. Let's take a look at a really quick video for an example a recap of that as quick as I can get out of this loop, as quickly as I can get out of this loop. Aha, uh -huh. I think we're there. Yes. Okay, so here's uh, some food coloring, inky particles, and on the left we have the ink going into hot, and on the right we have the ink going into cold. So you're going to see the ink diffuse faster in the hot water. What other ways is it going to diffuse faster? If you have a higher concentration, if you have smaller particles, if you have a greater surface area, and if it's in a gas. All right, let's move on to osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane. So whenever we're looking at osmosis, it's really important that you focus on the water. And at first it may seem like I'm going to belabor a very simple point, but if you focus on the water, I am pretty sure you're not going to get confused about the movement here. But you're going to see textbooks, and if you do online research, you can talk about uh, the movement and the concentration um, in the particles that are dissolved in the water or the amount of water. And if you focus on the number of particles, in other words, the solute dissolved in the solvent, then things can start to look backwards. So. I encourage you not to confuse yourself that way and always focus on the water and you'll be in good shape. So if you focus on the movement of the water, just like you'd expect from diffusion, the water's going to move from areas of high to areas of low concentration. So in our picture here on the left, we have more water on the right and less water on the left, and so the water is going to have more water molecules diffuse to the left if we have a semi-permeable membrane here. And in our little diagram here, we have little green dots, and they're representing some kind of a molecule or ion. And uh, since in the body, our main medium is salt water, sodium chloride, let's pretend we have little salt particles here. You will see definitions of osmosis that are going to focus on the uh, concentration of the uh, substance dissolved in the water, in other words, the um, solute. So if you focus on the solute, you can see that there are lots more little green dots, lots more salt on the left 
than the right. And so you will see definitions where they will talk about the solute or the dissolved substance, um, and that kind of looks backwards. But again, let's not get so confusing. Let's focus on the water, and the water is going to move where there's more water to where there's less water. Now, we're going to start to look at different forces of water at play, and what substances can cross over this barrier are going to um, be part of what determines what our balance is here. So if we're just looking at this fluid movement, we can be talking about osmotic pressure. But there are other forces at play when it comes to water, such as hydrostatic pressure, and we also have, and then fluid dynamics of moving water. Like if we're going to take the heart and we're going to pump blood, we're now talking about a moving substance as well. And then we've also got to consider what other substances are here and can they cross the membrane too? So, I mean, are we talking about substances that can cross over at the same time the water's crossing over? So are we going to kind of balance things out? Or are we talking about substances that cannot cross the barrier? And so basically, um, in order to understand another type of diffusion, which is called filtration, we actually have to start looking at these different forces of water, which get uh, a little bit more uh, layers of things to consider than just considering osmosis. So here we go, as soon as this works. I know this probably looks like a very simple pencil to operate, but for some reason it gets, it gets stuck here. Looks like we should be able to move on here, but then it's not letting me. Let me try erasing this first. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so let's take another look at another force of water so we can start to understand um, how filtration works in the body. And first of all, um, where we're going with this, where um, we're going to study filtration, um, well, two main places filtration happens in the body is, I'm sure you've heard that kidneys filter. Well, what do they filter? They filter blood. So you have to look at filtration in the kidneys. Uh, but another place, and that's actually where we're going to start, is looking at uh, filtration that happens at the capillary level, or how substances uh, cross over at the capillary level also involves a combination of forces. So let's take a look at hydrostatic pressure first. Now, people study the movement and the forces of water in all different kind of situations. And you're exposed, or I mean, you're dealing with the forces of water in your daily activities. Um, and so some of this is probably intuitive. And then other parts are, um, you know, perhaps get a little bit, uh, a little fuzzy. So we're going to try to unfuzzy the fuzziness. So um, when people study hydrostatic pressure outside of the body, it is, I mean, there's a complicated mathematical equation, but basically, I mean, roughly it's talking about the pressure of um, static water or still water, uh, the pressure of it uh, because of gravity. But in the body, uh, when you talk about hydrostatic pressure in the body, like in the blood vessels, you are talking about the pressure of the blood outward on the blood vessel wall. Let's pretend we're looking at a capillary here, and the hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of the blood against the wall. So down here at the capillary level, we've got these little red blood cells that 
have to squeeze in one at a time, single file, and they have an outward pressure of the blood and the blood plasma uh, that the red blood cells are in. This may or may not make sense. Um, let's take a look at water balloons. So if you fill up some water balloons, there is an outward pressure of the water. The fact that there is an outward pressure on the water that actually can expand the balloon when you fill it up with a pump still may or may not make sense, but I think what might help clarify it is if before you fill up the water balloon, you put some little pinpricks in the water balloon. Now fill up the water balloon that has pinpricks in it, and what do you think is going to happen? Well, there's going to be, you know, little trickles of water sprinkling out, which is a good one to do on a hot day. What's some way that we could take this water balloon here, let's pretend our little yellow water balloon here has pinpricks in it, and let's pretend we already tied it off. What is a way that we could expand this already tied off water balloon? Well, or increase the pressure. Well, we could um, squeeze the water balloon and increase the pressure. And if we do that, what do you think is going to happen? Well, these little trickles of water are going to be streams of water. And they're going to become more like squirt guns. Even more fun to do on a hot day. I'm sure you've played with water pressure um, in different circumstances. And you know, in, you also talk about fluid dynamics. So not just stationary water, but moving water. So uh, if, you take a wa if you take a garden hose and you keep the, um, you know, the water turned on to a certain uh, level, let's say you twist, twist open um, the um, the um, nozzle, like let's say you turn it on three times, um, three turns. And then um, you can put your thumb over part of the um, opening of the hose, and let's say you cover half of the hose with your thumb, but you have the same amount of water pressure going through. What's going to happen? Well, the water pressure is going to, you know, it's going to come out a lot harder or a lot faster. I mean, we've all experienced, you know, um, well, another way that you can change that water pressure, though, is how much water you run through the system. You know, and I mean, you do this even when you take a shower or you um, clean dishes. Um, and here on the bottom left, I mean, you know, there's a tremendous amount of pressure coming through the firefighter's hose. It takes uh, some very fit firefighters to um, control, you know, the back pressure of this hose. And I mean, you can increase the water pressure, um, you know, strong enough to, you know, clean houses as well. In the, um, in the body, Of course, we're stuck here again. All right, there we go. All right, in the body, uh, what I started to allude to and start to draw a diagram here is uh, the many then many forces then that it, that are at play in a capillary where the exchange of oxygen occurs. So in filtration in filtration situations like this, you're actually dealing with a net pressure of fluids. So you have the osmotic pressure that we talked about earlier, where the water wants to go, where there's more water. Um, a higher concentration of water versus the substances that are dissolved in it versus uh, the area where there's a lower concentration of water. And then you have the hydrostatic pressure that we just talked about. In the capillaries, um, this ends up being that the water wants to push its way in and the hydrostatic pressure wants to push its way out. 
So why, you know, some of you may be curious why the water wants to go in. Well, our little red blood cells and our blood plasma has a lot of big molecules dissolved in it that are basically too big to fit through the little capillary slits. And so really, really big molecules, you're going to tend to get more of them on the inside of the cell because they're not going to slip out these slits as easily. So what are the biggest molecules you can think of in the body? Proteins. And it just so happens that there's a lot of albumin. There are other proteins too, but there's a lot of albumin in um, inside. And so the water um, has a tendency, has an attraction, osmotic pressure to go in, hydrostatic pressure going out. And then what we're going to look at here for the total fluid flow is the net pressure of the fluids. And it just so happens that there is actually even one more uh, force at play here, and that on the arterial side, you're closer to the heart pump, and there's actually going to be more moving pressure this way, and that's going to kind of decrease as we go. So there's going to be less pressure here if we look at the fluid dynamics. Which brings us to um, a couple very short videos and a challenge. Um, I will encourage you, since you're going to be working, you, since you work with water every day, I encourage you to think about the water um, every time you um, are using water to think about which kind of forces are at play and how, this, um, how these situations are similar or different to the different types of water pressure that are in effect in the body. And there, um, there are a lot of forces here at play, but one, um, one way you can think about it also is the flow of water in rivers. So if we take a really big river like the Mississippi, and these guys, they actually traveled the, um, they canoed the whole length of it. But if you take a really wide river like the Mississippi, and you take the thousands of gallons that are flowing through this wide channel um, per you know square foot, and you took those same amount, that same amount of water flow in a really uh, narrow river, if it was the same amount of narrow flow, uh, water flow, what do you think the water flow would be like by comparison to the flow of the Mississippi? Well, if we took the same amount of water flow and we rushed it through the river, you know, we would have some serious white water rapids going on. So and we could change um, the width of the passageway and use the same amount of flow, or we could actually change the amount of flow or both. And these are the kind of variables we'll see in the body and how the body actually takes advantage of these situations uh, for things like how the little um, blood vessels break into smaller and smaller and until they're into capillaries. Um, you know, instead of changing the um, same amount of flow, different size of river, you could also take the same size river and different amount of flow. And I mean, you can see that in the mountains around here in the summer, uh, streams and water flow, uh, waterfalls that dry up or, you know, become uh, slower or non-existent. And then in the spring, when the snow melts off, you get these great rushes of water and these beautiful waterfalls. In actual cells, there's still yet one more important way to look at this water flow and some important terminology around it, and that is the concept of tonicity. Tonicity is basically looking at the fluid medium outside the cell compared to the inside of the cell and the percentage 
of the uh, dissolved solutes that cannot cross the membrane, the non-penetrating substances. So this concept of tonicity is similar and related to os osmosis and osmotic pressure, but what we're looking at here is um, focusing on the substances, uh, solutions with substances that cannot cross the barrier. So there's basic th basically three different variables or possibilities. An isotonic solution or um, medium is uh, pictured in the left here. And on the bottom picture, we have a little biconcave disc of a red blood cell. And on the bottom here, this is a um, electron micrograph of a real RBC. And in an isotonic medium, the percentage of the dissolved solute is about the same on the outside and the inside. Um, so, you know, things like the salt, glucose, proteins. And you're going to have a uh, net flow that is balanced in and out of the cell, which is going to make a nice normal shaped cell with the water flow in and out being balanced. In a hypertonic medium, hyper for more, the outside medium, the intracellular fluid or extracellular fluid, has more substances dissolved in it, a higher concentration of dissolved molecules and or ions. And so if you've got more substances on the outside, that means the water is going to flow more outward. And so with this little red blood cell, you have on the bottom here in the middle an electron micrograph picture of an actual little red blood cell in a hypertonic medium. And it's getting all spiky because the water is flowing out of the cell in a hypertonic medium. Last but not least, in a hypotonic medium, hypo for under, below, or less, the solution or the medium, the extracellular fluid, intra, the extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid has fewer uh, substances dissolved in it and so uh, than the inside of the cell. And so the um, fluid, the water from outside of the cell is going to rush inside the cell. Like let's say there were more proteins, a higher percentage of proteins in the cell, let's say, um, then outside, the water is going to rush in, and this electron micrograph of the big basketball-like red blood cell that's lost its little biconcave shape is in a hypotonic medium. We're going to watch a quick little experiment uh, where you can take some dialysis tubing, which is the kind of a semi-permeable membrane used in kidney dialysis, when people have kidney failure, their kidneys are not filtering blood well enough, and they actually go through a dialysis machine to have their blood filtered for them, uh, you can use this semi-permeable tubing and run it through a machine to filter the blood. So this experiment uses this dialysis tubing to create little pretend cells. And in the little pretend cells, we're going to put now think through this process here. If the cell with the di is the dialysis tubing, and we're going to put molasses inside the cell and dip that dialysis, uh, dialysis tube cell full of molasses in a beaker of water. So inside has lots of dissolved substances. Outside is pure water, no dissolved substances. Are we talking about isotonic medium, hypertonic medium, or hypotonic medium? Again, think, do we have uh, inside of the cell has lots of substances like proteins, salts, sugars, and in this case, molasses. Outside is pure water. We're talking about a hypotonic medium. So what do you think the water is going to do? Let's take a look. And a dialysis tubing is a membrane that if we put 
uh, compound inside, like water or molasses, if the molecules are very large, they can't pass through the little tiny holes in the membrane. But if they're very small, they'll pass through. That's why it's called semi-permeable. Little things will pass through, but not big things. So what we're going to do to test that osmotic pressure inside and outside is we're going to use this as if it were a cell. We're going to take the molasses and pour into our dialysis tubing. And then we're going to tie it. We're going to make two like this. One we'll use as our control. The second one we'll put in a beaker of water. Two hours later, let's see what our results are. You can see definite change in the volumes. And if we move this around, you can see that in this larger volume, the molasses is not nearly as viscous. So we have plenty of evidence to support the fact that the water molecules move through the dialysis tubing and it's diluted the molasses. So the osmotic pressure was the driving force that brought the water in. All right, cool. Now, if you take a minute, um, you could pause the recording and create this experiment in, uh, create, a ver create a variation of this experiment. How you could take dialysis tubing and make little cells so that you could um, see the effects of an isotonic medium, a hypertonic medium, and a hypotonic medium. And that's actually going to be one of your uh, homework assignments for this, um, this assignment, is to write up a little experiment of how you would take dialysis tubing um, with molasses or salt and recreate this experiment, but not just for the hypotonic version, but also make an isotonic version and a hypertonic version. And one thing she didn't do for that experiment, although I think it's great for a quick little visual, is she didn't actually measure anything. So with your experiment, go ahead and take the time to uh, create a quick little system of how you're going to uh, create some kind of a control situation and some kind of actual measurements for your results. One last little um, example here to think about is uh, taking a bath in Epsom salt. So take a bath in Epsom salt and drop in 10 drops of your favorite essential oil. And then go ahead and think about which uh, types of active and or passive transport are occurring and if there's any situations occurring that involve osmosis and or a hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic medium and any of the other water pressures at play through the whole process of taking the bath. And then go ahead and enjoy yourself. Take a long enough bath so that you get the little raisin fingers and raisin toes uh, to make sure that you get to um, experience uh, some of the movement of the water. All right, so that's different forms of osmosis. Uh, excuse me, different forms of filtration. We've got passive, uh, we've got facilitated, we've got osmosis, and then when we look at filtration, we're actually looking at different forces of water. But now, let's throw some energy into the mix. Let's use energy and see what kind of forms of active transport we have. We're going to start off with a really, really quick video. Um, and he's actually going to pair, compare active transport to passive transport in less than a minute. Don't you wish I could lecture that fast? Talking about active transports, which, act, which actually require energy. And remember, passive transports does not require any, any energy. And there are two types of passive transports. We have the simple diffusion and we have the facilitated diffusion, which requires a protein transport. Now, passive diffusion is where solids move down their concentration gradient in passive transport. And this is essentially if we have a container with a permeable membrane, this is for facilitated, and it's an aqueous solution, 
which means that the solvent is water and the solutes are in water. <laughs> and as you can see, the solutes are more concentrated on the right hand side. And so the solutes will move down its concentration gradient to an area where it's highly concentrated to an area where it's lower, lower concentrated. So it's moving from the right to the left. And this is facilitated diffusion, or which is part of passive diffusion, which requires no energy. Active transport also uses a protein transport, but it requires energy. So let's look at the difference here. So we have a container again with a permeable membrane, and we have a transporter, as you can see in the middle. And this is an aqueous solution, so the water is a solvent. And as you can see, the solutes are still highly concentrated on the right. Now normally, it will move down its concentration gradient, but in active transport, the solutes move against its concentration gradient, and so requires energy. So it moves to an area where it's highly concentrated, and it's the reverse of passive. Now active transporters, let's just look at a quick example. Here we have a lipid bilayer. Here we have a active transport. And the solutes, as you can see, are highly concentrated on the outside of the cell compared to the inside. Now this is an example of the primary active transport, and we'll look at the difference soon. So here's a primary active transport. Now the main energy used for active transport is ATP. What happens is that a solute will bind to the active side of this transporter, and ATP will be used, a phosphate group, will be attached to the transporter. And when ATP is used, this protein transporter will flip, essentially, because energy is used, causing it to flip. And the phosphate is still bound to it. The phosphate group is still bound to the protein, as you can see. And so then, the solute is released to the outside. So it, it's going against. A All right, and that, that last, oh, this is, uh, it acts, it, flip to the beginning here. It's, uh, by the way, if you like his drawing explanation, there's a lot of them on YouTube. It's Armando Hasudunagando. I'm sorry, I can't say his last name, but if you look up Armando, I think it's H-A-S-U-D-U-N-G-A-O or something like that. Um, what I actually wanted to focus on there was at the end, uh, an important term came up there was a conformational change, and we're going to take a look at that. Um, but let's take a look here uh, quickly again. So basically active transport, you're going to um, move against the concentration gradient. So you can basically stack ions or molecules uh, against the concentration gradient uh, to move things um, out of the cell. Um, for example, if you want to build an, you know, sort of an artificially uh, high um, stacked concentration gradient so that when you let molecules come rushing through, um, you can diffuse them through faster. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, basically, what example we're looking at here is um, the sodium potassium pump. And uh, this is a primary active transport mechanism. And there's basically two primary active transports uh, that use these pumps. There's uh, primary and secondary. And what is, you know, kind of most common to look at is the primary one with this most common example being the sodium potassium pump. And um, this pump is going on nonstop you know, basically just <laughs> constantly moving these little sodium and, and uh, potassium ions across the membrane um, to get the cell ready uh, to, to make an excitable membrane for, uh, for example, for the transmission of nerve signals. Um, and he did a great job explaining it here, but this uh, binding of the phosphate in the adenosine triphosphate um, <clears throat> uses energy. This is where the energy gets used in a hydrolysis that um, ends up changing the shape of the protein. And when the protein changes shape, that's called a conformational change. And basically, in this case, you can, uh, with that change, it makes it so it fits three sodiums in, and then on the way back down, to um, 
two potassiums on the way back in, and so on. Let's take a really quick uh, look at a video that shows this well. The sodium potassium pump is an, act is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate group from the ATP remains bound with the channel. The sodium ions are released on the other side of the membrane outside of the cell and the new shape of the channel has a high affinity for potassium ions and two of these ions now bind to the channel. This binding again causes a change in the shape of the protein channel and this conformational change releases the phosphate group on the cytoplasm side. This release allows the channel to revert to its original shape and as a result the potassium ions are released inside the cell. In its original shape the channel has a high affinity for sodium ions and when these ions bind again they initiate another cycle. The important characteristic of this pump is that both sodium and potassium ions are moving from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. In other words, each ion is moving against its concentration gradient. This type of movement can only be achieved by the constant expenditure of ATP energy. All right, cool. And so that's primary. That's an example of primary active transport. And then secondary active transport. Uh, I don't have a picture of it here, um, but secondary active transport is basically um, taking advantage of uh, the energy used in primary active transport. So to use an analogy um, or you know an example, like if you pump water uphill, like let's say you pump it to a water tower or you pump it out of a well, um, you've used the energy to move the water up and now you basically have stored energy because you can now take advantage of you know the water being higher up, take advantage of gravity. So you use the energy to get the water up higher, and now you can let that water flow back on through. So secondary active transport is basically taking advantage of um, you know these differentials um, in concentration gradients that the um, energy from ATP is used to create, so then that the substances can flow back down to move stuff back across, such as um, glucose um, or you know substances in the digest in the digestive tract. Other forms of uh, that require. Uh, of uh, movement across the plasma membrane that require the use of energy are um, uh, very similar uh, to each other. One is endocytosis and one is exocytosis. And it's basically um, moving particles and substances in or outside of the cell membrane. Um, so basically, um, endocytosis is taking substances in and exocytosis is gaining substances out. Um, and they're very similar processes, uh, but an example of endocytosis is the way white blood cells eat uh, cell bacteria. And in the upper right picture here is an actual uh, electron micrograph picture of an actual white blood cell taking in this substance here, which I'm um, going to guess is a bacteria. And so the uh, plasma membrane can actually enfold around it. And back to the bubble experiment, uh, remember when she took a string that you could move in and out of the membrane. So if you take a substance that has a little phospholipid bilayer, um, like in exocytosis here, this little phospholipid bilayer, it could actually fuse with the membrane and then open up and release stuff. So releasing substances from in the cell to out of the cell, you know, takes advantage of that with exocytosis. And then endocytosis, kind of similarly, this uh, membrane can move around <clears throat> and engulf substances. And then, you know, typically what happens is once the substance is surrounded, the body will um, inject or infuse um, enzymes that can break it down. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's basically two types of endocytosis. 
cell eating and cell drinking. Cell eating is phagocytosis and cell eating is pinocytosis. All right, so when the cell brings substances in, there's basically two different types, and they're very, very similar, basically whether it's taken in a solid or a liquid. So if the cell is taken in a solid, a uh, substance that's primarily solid like uh, bacteria, it's called cell eating uh, phagocytosis. And if it's taken in a uh, substance that's mostly liquid, that's called cell drinking or pinocytosis. Last but not least is the cell getting substances out of itself um, and such as if the body, uh, if the cell creates uh, substances like neurotransmitters or hormones to get those little substances out, it'll sort of make a little tiny bubble full of the substances and that little phospholipid mini bubble bilayer can fuse with the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane and then let those little vesicles of substances out. Last but not least, we're going to uh, look at one more short video that basically summarizes all of the uh, passive and active processes that we study today. Before we can use the molecules we eat, they have to enter our cells, starting with the cells lining the small intestine. Let's zoom in to the surface of a cell. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Some molecules can move across it, while others cannot. How do materials enter and leave cells? Lipids such as these yellow molecules, can dissolve in the lipid bilayer. Notice how they move down their concentration gradient, from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. This is an example of diffusion. Diffusion is a form of passive transport. It does not require energy from the cell. Most molecules can't cross the lipid bilayer. Here, the sugar fructose moves into intestinal cells by facilitated diffusion, moving down its concentration gradient through a transport protein. Facilitated diffusion doesn't require energy from the cell, so it's also a form of passive transport. Water crosses the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion, or by diffusing across the lipid bilayer directly. The diffusion of water across a membrane is called osmosis. The sodium-potassium pump moves ions against their concentration gradient, from where they are less concentrated to where they are more concentrated. This requires energy from the cell and is known as active transport. Energy from ATP is used to move sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions in. Another type of active transport is co-transport. Here, both sodium ions and glucose move into the cell through a co-transporter protein. Sodium ions move down the concentration gradient created by the sodium-potassium pump, and glucose moves against its concentration gradient. Now let's move to the other side of our intestinal cell. Materials can be exported in vesicles that fuse with the plasma membrane and release their contents outside the cell. This process is called exocytosis. In endocytosis, the plasma membrane pinches in, forming a vesicle that contains material from outside the cell. On this side of the cell, we can also see oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing across the lipid bilayer. Cells use all these processes to get what we need. All right, pretty awesome stuff. Um, so 
there are a lot of concepts to uh, wrestle with um, when you first starting uh, start studying anatomy and physiology. Even in this one uh, lecture, there's a lot here. So I highly recommend that uh, as you go about your daily activities, you start actually uh, thinking about how these concepts relate to anatomy and physiology and start forming pictures and analogies in your head and uh, come back uh, more than once to these concepts. Um, and if you take a little time to think about them, let yourself wrestle with them, you um, will get to the place where this all starts to sink in. Thanks for your time. Next time, we're going to look at organelles.